Through the middle of a war, ended up in Japan, long story, and ended up getting to China, was a missionary there, and ended up uh, impacting thousands of lives. A missionary ran into her later on, because she had worked so far back into the country there, uh, other missionaries had absolutely no contact with her, and they didn't even realize she was there. Another missionary came in contact with her later in life, and when he read the Chinese that she had written for an advertisement in the newspaper, he said that he thought it was a Chinese national. He didn't realize that she had learned Chinese so well that she could speak it absolutely fluently. But anyways, I listened to a devotional that she gave on BBC uh, towards the end of her life, and she said, I gave up everything. I, I wanted to be married. I wanted to have a family just like every other woman in England at the time. But I gave that all up, and God ended up giving me back many more. You know what verse she cited was the passage in Matthew where it says, if you give up something for God, God will return it 60, 100 fold back to you. And that was the verse that she cited. And you know what she said? I gave up children for God, and God gave me back not just 60, not just 100 fold, but many, many children. There, there were so thousands of orphans through because of the war in World War II at that time in China. And of course, she, a lot of them fell under her care and her guidance, and she ended up protecting them. There were people all across China who remembered her as their only mother. And even to this day, there are people that, that live in China to this day that say, my mother was a little British woman named Gladys Aylward, and she was the only one who cared in the midst of a big war. So... Don't underestimate what God can do through any one of us, right? In Titus chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let the aged women likewise, as they behave as to come with holiness, not false accusers, give it to much wine, but te teachers of good things. God wants you all and women to teach good things and to pass on traditions and culture and good things unto of the younger women, that they may teach Specifically, a certain group of people, the young women, to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at all, good, obedient to their own husbands, and the word of God be not blasphemed. So that's a very powerful description in Titus. This is, all, this is not just found in the Old Testament. This is found all the way through the New Testament as well. So the men I mentioned earlier, your application is to look for ways you can praise the women in your life. If you are like me and you struggle to praise People, this is going to give you some practical ways. So write these things down, underline a verse that you find here in this passage, and go, that's something I know the woman in my life does. I'm going to praise her for that today and just share with her how she does that. So at least pick one or two ways, man, as you listen through this. So the first point today is number two point on my list here. God says that a godly woman, godly woman's virtue is her greatest asset. Is it her looks? No. Is it her figure? No. It's her virtue. What does virtue mean? It's kind of a lost word today. But let's look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4. It says, A virtuous woman is a crown unto her husband, and she maketh a shame as rottenness into his bones. Ruth chapter 3, verse 11. This is Boaz speaking, who was not a, at that time any relation to Ruth. He hardly even knew her. She had just had been one of the people who had come and worked in his fields uh, and had harvested some of the crops there. And he says unto her, he said, Now, my daughter, fear not, I will do unto thee all that thou requirest. For the city of my people, thou, thou dost know that thou art a virtuous woman. Here's Boaz. He doesn't know much about her as far as history. He doesn't even realize at that point she's not even Jewish. She's actually a Moabitess. Uh, and she's come over uh, to his nation. But he knows one thing about her, and that is that she is a virtuous woman. Wow. He doesn't know much about her, but he knows that she's a virtuous woman. Is it possible to tell a virtuous woman even by not knowing that much about her? Yeah, I think so. Virtue is basically doing what honors God, right? It's having all the good character qualities, basically. Those things that a woman invests in, and that is her good character and her, and her nature of doing what is right over what is doing wrong. And Ruth was known as a virtuous woman. So, women... Work on virtue. That's your greatest asset. Like it says there in Proverbs in verse 10, it says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. Wow. That is, a, that is a, a powerful thing. Greatest asset ever. Number three, God says that a woman earns the trust. God says that a godly woman earns the trust of her husband. Let's look at verse 11. The heart of her husband will safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Uh, that sounds a little bit, that sounds a little bit funny to you at first. It's like, what? Wait a minute. What is, what is being said here? What is spoil? Let's define that first of all. 
spoil this like is basically going out and you're in war and you go out and you, you, you take some of the, the, the bad guy's stuff and you take it home and that's your treasure, that's your build upon your wealth. So a lot, at that time, that's how a lot of people who were lowly classes built up wealth was by going in and stealing it from other peoples and nations during wartime. And this says basically that a, a, a man who has a virtuous woman in his life won't need to go and practice that because he will have trust in her. He won't need to go out and, and uh, do other things away from the home, get, probably get into trouble because he trusts the woman in his life. Are you a trustworthy woman? I have to apologize, women. I'm going to kind of lay it on you in the past. I've kind of just been encouraging, but uh, this is going to be some tough concepts. Of course, men, we want you to be trustworthy too. Uh, but women, are you trustworthy? Can, do the men in your life trust you absolutely? And boy, I know some of you, I've heard the men in your life come to me and tell me that I trust the woman in my life. Absolutely. I know that she would never betray me in any way or do something wrong. And they're satisfied with their place in life because they have a woman in their life that is trustworthy. So that's a, a huge way that a woman can impact society around her. God says that a godly woman will do good to her husband all the days of her life. Now let's go back and redefine this again. What does all mean? All means all, and that's all all means, right? We've done that a few times. Right? So is it, is it just the time that she's married? No. Because a lot of love. Let's face it, right? Depending on the situation, sometimes people are married for sometimes a short amount of time, right? So pass away, divorce can happen, things, things happen, life happens, right? Sometimes you're married for a short amount of time, sometimes you're married for a long period of time, but usually there's, you know, 20, 30 years before you get married. And sometimes for women who usually survive men uh, in their later years, sometimes there's many years even after uh, their husband could pass away. So how does a woman honor her husband every single day of her life? Uh, even before she gets married or after she is married to him. This includes before she is married by staying pure. I wrote that in there. Uh, just, and a woman stays pure. And you know what? Uh, someone told, a pastor told the story when he was a young teenage guy, fell in love with his wife, who was not his wife at that time, was going to become his wife. And he, he took her out on, on several dates, and they were on one date. And he got tempted. He was a typical guy. And he's like, you know what? I, I really like to take this to the next level. And he was going to touch her inappropriately. And she said, no. And she shoved his hand away. You know what his response was? I want to marry that woman. I want to marry that woman. Because I know she will honor, honor herself and her husband all the days of her life. So, women, don't think you're going to destroy the relationships with the men in your life by, being acting, in a, by, by acting appropriately and having boundaries. Boundaries show that you honor yourself and that you honor God and that you, honor, you will honor relationships in the future. So stay pure before marriage. And she also honors him after he has passed by honoring his memory. You know, some, I've heard some women speak negatively of their husbands that have passed away. And that is not a crown to her. Uh, but I've heard the women who have been through sometimes tough relationships. Their husbands weren't always the best of guys, but they always spoke honorably of that individual. They honored them, the position, even though the man was not always honorable. And I think that's how a woman can honor her husband all the days of her life. There may be other ways, but you can think of, it, think of other ways yourself. Uh, number five, God says that a godly woman will be industrious and hardworking. Let's look at verse 13. She seeth wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. And is it good for men to work with their hands? Yes. Amen, brother. It is good. It's good to get out there and get some sweat flowing. It's good for us men. If you don't do it, you got to go to the gym to do it, right? Some of us have jobs where you can get out there and we can work hard and we get that sweat flowing. Men, it's good for us to work hard. It's good for us to be out there and work hard and to experience that good work. But women, it's also good for them as well. I remember our family used to boast that uh, uh, when they settled uh, up to the western upstate New York, uh, that the women in the family, the pioneers in the family, they helped build the house just right along with the rest of the men. And uh, that's certainly true. There used to be an age, day and age where, you know, they, they, we didn't differentiate really. The women just worked alongside men. They did the same type of chores. They worked just as hard, sometimes harder than the men. Probably harder than I do, that's for sure, today. And uh, uh, they were not afraid of hard work. God says a godly woman is not afraid of hard work. She's willing to jump in there and do whatever it takes to serve and to be industrious and to, to work hard and to uh, produce things. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful thing 
that we, be, we produce things, and we are productive people, uh, that we're, we're actually making physical things to, uh, to be productive. Let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. We've got an example here in Acts. For as much as Lydia was nigh unto Joppa, and the disciples that heard that Peter was there, they said to them, to the two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And then Peter arose. Peter really it's instantly realized that this is an important situation. You know, there were a lot of women probably in Joppa at that time, maybe a lot of needy women, but Peter said that this is something we've got to get up, we've got to take care of right now. Uh, when he was come, they were brought into the upper chamber, and the widows stood by the weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. So Dorcas was a productive individual. She made all these different things. And they honored her by saying, hey, this is something that she made for us. Uh, not, not trying to take advantage, but, but giving. And Peter uh, put, the, put all that forth, kneeled down and prayed, and said, and turning unto the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And when she opened her eyes, she then saw Peter and said, she rose from the dead. Peter said, hey, this is a woman we need to have back. Can't let her go now. And she gave her, gave her his hand and lifted her up when he had called the saints and the widows and presented her alive. God did this miracle for this woman who was productive. She was industrious. She worked hard. There was a lot to show for the work that she had done. Now, I think it's a beautiful thing. You know, sometimes the, the, after a hard day's work, you have something you can show for, right? And a woman is the same way. There's many different things. And sometimes we try to put women in a certain category of box and they can only do these certain things or these certain jobs. No, women can do many, many different jobs and express their gender in many different ways by being creative and industrious. And God wants godly women to be creative and industrious. So, number six, God says that godly women will be a source of good food for, for all found in her care. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. She is like the merchant ships. What are merchant ships? They bring, they carry stuff from one place to another. Large amounts of stuff, actually. And she bringeth food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and to a portion to her maidens. Basically, that's saying that she is always available to cook food, bring food, even when food is scarce. Uh, we live in a day and time where we can walk into a supermarket and you not only, you don't have just a couple of packs of cereal, you have probably a whole shelf full of cereal, cereal brands that you can choose from. And we have all different kinds of food all over at our fingertips. Probably back when this was written, food was not that available. It was difficult to get. It took a lot of hard work to go and find, bring in food, process food, and uh, then bring it to the table. And she is not afraid of that hard work. She's willing to do it and work hard and show generous hospitality to all who come into her care. Everyone, and that is when it says her maidens, that's basically saying that the lowest people found in her care, she even makes sure that they are well cared for, well fed, and well taken care of. And I think that's a beautiful concept that uh, the women do that. It's almost to show that the women in our life care very much that we have uh, plenty of food to eat, right? Uh, us men are very thankful for that. Uh, so anyways, uh, number seven, God says that a godly woman will be skilled in property management. What? She'll live and buy property? Yeah, it says it right here. Let's look at verse 16. And she considereth a field and buyeth it, and the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. Wow, I thought that was a man's job. Well, it can be a man's job. But a woman can also buy and manage property. And it's a good thing. God, you know, uh, in, in the old, when, the, when they were settling the land, and uh, after they conquered the, the land, the Israelites there, in the early part of the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, there were a number of women who all the men in their lives had been killed. And they came to Joshua and they said, you know what, uh, we still believe that it's right for us to have an inheritance. I know that culture dictates, most of the cultures at that time did not allow women to own property, but they said, we believe that God would honor us uh, to build our own property in and of ourselves. And God said, give those women the property, not part of it, or a little fraction of it, but give it all to them. They deserve to own all of that land because it's their, it's their father's inheritance and they deserve to have it. Uh, it, their gender, it does not matter, their gender. And uh, that, that's, that was a pretty co uh, controversial thing at that time. Uh, women were not allowed to own own property in any way, shape, or form through most cultures, through most of history. Uh, but God says it's okay for a woman to own property, manage property, and to uh, do it well, and to be skilled at it. Wow, to be good at it. Uh, men, do you seek the counsel of your wife? When you go out and buy property, 
Uh, I've heard many, many stories uh, where men, they go, like, oh, this looks like a perfect piece of property. And their wife says, you know what? I just feel a check in my spirit. I feel like God does not want me, does not want you to buy that piece of property. And then the man says, you know what? Well, then I'm the boss, and God says I'm the boss, so I'm just going to do what I want to do. And they go out and buy the property, and it ends up being a total disaster. There's just countless illustrations of that. They didn't listen to the, the properties of their wife. Well, women, how do men listen to that? Because God doesn't just say that they should be able to have properties and be able to give you some good advice. It actually says that they should be able to buy and manage property for themselves and be very good at it. So women can do those things and should. A God and women should be, have that ability to manage property and, and be able to not only uh, use, but also use the property that they have. You can see the second part of that verse is the fruit of her hands. She planted a vineyard. So she not only just has land sitting lying fallow, but she makes that land productive and, and prosperous for not only herself, but also for her family and her husband. So God wants women to practice these things, uh, to use their assets wisely and to multiply them and to, uh, to be a blessing to other people out of that. Trust me, if, if you don't have a lot of money, it's hard to give money, right? If, you're, if your bank account's empty, it's difficult to go out and give. But when God multiplies that, then you should respond by giving. And that's what this woman does. She, she brings it in, but she's also putting it out. And God blesses her. Uh, there was an individual, I think it was down in Florida. It just felt like God wanted him to give his money away. So he just started giving. He just, here's money, here's money. And he would go and find people who had special needs and special challenges. He would give to them. Eventually, he ran out of money. But he had such a knowledge about how to give and other people recognized that, that they started sending him money. And more and more money kept coming. And now he owns a nonprofit organization. All he does is give away money. He goes and finds needs that people, you know, somebody has rent. And in fact, I think this day, if you write it, I don't remember his name, sorry. <laughs> Maybe you can look him up online or something like that. If you write him, and you say, hey, I can't make my rent this week, or so whatever, he'll write you a check. Uh, people recognize the fact that he has a skill in giving, so they give him money to give. Uh, so giving, is, you can't give unless you have something to give from. So she multiplies the assets that she has to produce more so that she could be continually give and be skilled in that way. God says that a godly woman will do what she can to maintain both inner and outer strength. Let's look at verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Is it okay for women to work out? Yeah, I guess so. And most women, you know, my wife, she, she gets a lot of work out, right? She's like two little babies, right? They don't take very long running around with those. You get, you get some pretty buff arms, right? Uh, but women, it's okay. Build strength. You know, take care of your health. Be strong. Not only inner strength, but also an outer strength. Girding your loins is more of an inner strength. Your arms is an outter strength. Uh, it's good for her to be strong. I, I noticed uh, there's a group of women who meet every night. I think it's 5 o'clock over there at the, the hall there. And they, they work on working some of that outer strength. And I think that's a great thing. You guys should be doing that. If you're not involved, then get involved. Maybe I need to go over there and work out a few times. Uh, but go and, and develop both an inner and outer strength. God wants a godly woman to have both. Uh, so that she can continue to be healthy and be prosperous. And God can use her mightily. Verse nine, number 9. God says that a godly woman will take care of the assets and trust it to her by God. Let's look at verse 18. Uh, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. So what is that saying? It, it might come through a little bit. It's, it's kind of a double meaning in Hebrew. So when you translate it, it kind of loses a little bit of it. But basically, she always has stock of her merchandise. Everything that is, is, is given under her name or her household, she keeps track of it. And my wife is, is now starting a program where she wants, she said, bring, to bring me all your receipts. And I've in the past tried to keep track of you know, where the money goes. They gave a little black ledger and things like that. But she wants to go take it the next step. So she says, bring me, if you spend any money, bring, bring it to me. We're going to try to keep track of all the funds, outgoing funds. And so that we can budget better. And I think that's a beautiful, wonderful application of this passage. A, a godly woman knows the assets that she has, and she keeps a careful management of them. And the fact that her candle does not go out by night is that she doesn't ever get lax in that ability. She constantly checks and manages her assets. What's the first thing to asset loss? If you go to any business principal class and you go, hey, you know what? Uh, you're losing assets, you're losing money somewhere. Uh, what do you need to do? You always start with 
we got to go back and keep track of everything. What is all, where is all of our assets, right? Because a lot of times, how many men, you start a project in your, in your bathroom, right? You're starting to take apart the sink, and you realize, where's my crescent wrench, or, or where's my wrench? You go in there and look at the garage, you can't find it where it's supposed to be because you misplaced it, right? So you, what do you do? You go out and you buy another one, right? And then you get home, you work on the project, you go to throw it back in the drawer, and you realize you set the wrench up on the shelf. And now you got two of them. And you just spent the money for a second one when you could have saved that money. And, what, and, and, and why did that happen? Because you did not keep track of the tools you had. Right? And so a godly woman and a godly man, this applies to men as well, will keep track of their assets so they're not wasting money, or wasting God's things. So where does all money come from? Right? We better answer this question just to start with. Where does, all, where does all of your money come from? God, right? God's the one that gave it to you, gave the job to work. Of the skill to be able to earn it or whatever. Uh, God, all of your assets are ultimately God's. Well, you should you should first of all give them to Him and then He gives it back to you. What's a steward? Do you know what a steward is? A biblical concept for steward? A steward is someone who takes care of someone else's stuff. That's a biblical concept of a steward. And the reality is, is every single one of you this morning should be a steward. I don't own my stuff. God owns my stuff. I'm just the steward that takes care of it. So, if God gave you money and assets and wrenches and things like that, He wants you to take good care of it. And this woman is godly because she takes care of all the assets that she's been entrusted with. No matter what it is, no matter how small, she makes sure that she has an accurate record of it, where it is, how to find it, and how to use it. So, uh, a godly woman will maintain... Uh, her inner and outer strength, God will, will take careful care of the assets entrusted to her by God. So, let's say that again. We're all stewards, right? None of us own anything. It's all God's given it all to us. We're going to give it back to Him. And He's entrusting us with the care of it. And when you think of your money that way, it gives you a better motivation to multiply it and then use it wisely. Not to waste it. Because sometimes if you think it's my money, then it's okay to waste. But if it's God's money, it's a different story, right? So, God says that a godly woman will be a skilled creator of things, or product, productivity, right? That's where we get that word. Uh, producing something, uh, something tangible. Uh, verse 19, uh, let's look at that. She lays her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. Does that mean that every single woman should know how to sew and do all these? Well, that would be a great thing to know how to do. But I think a godly woman has many assets, uh, productive skills. It's okay for a woman to have productive skills and to use them. Men, if you're limiting the women in your life, their ability to, to learn skills and to use them, then you are not following God's will, okay? Uh, because women should be constantly attaining new skills and be learning to use them for God's glory. And some of you do that. There's all kinds of sewing groups and different things where people get together and uh, use their creative uh, geniuses to uh, produce uh, actual product and material. Uh, because product and material is a blessing, right? We, live, we don't want to be materialistic where we worship the material, but yet if we have extra material goods to be able to give to other people, we can be a blessing and honor God through it, right? So, a godly woman is a skilled creator of things. She uses her hands and she uses her skills to be able to use them to be a blessing to others. And then she passes them on. And I remember... My grandmother, she could sit there and watch TV, and she could knit. And it's amazing. She can print all these different little sweaters and things like that. And so my sister said, you know what? I can see my grandmother just has this skill. I'd like to learn that, too. And so my grandmother taught that to my sister. This is a skill. Men, we should be doing that for our sons, too. Right? Or whatever skill we have. Passing those skills on. Whether it's fence building or fixing a tractor or whatever it is. Passing those tangible skills on to the next generation. And pretty soon, my sister could sit there and watch TV, too, and she could just, you know, and she'd be able to do it with her hands. I didn't even build a thing about it. So, having tangible skills, learning tangible skills, and learning to be a blessing through those skills is what a godly woman does. Number 11, God says that a godly woman will have concern for the poor. Godly man, too, right? But he stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She cares for those that are suffering, those who have no, no need. And you know what? I bet a woman who follows all these principles, 
all these principles in here, I think she's going to have plenty to give away. I don't want to mention that earlier. You can get out. It's hard to give away money. You don't have enough money. But a productive woman like this, she probably has tons of extra stuff that she can give to the needy and be a blessing to them and share. Maybe her husband's not doing it, but she is. So women, don't wait for your husband to do these things. You can start doing these things right now. This doesn't say, that there's no qualification in here that says, if your husband is a godly man, you can be this woman. It doesn't say that. You can start being this woman if you're not even married at all. Uh, we want to start being this woman today. It has no, no bearing on the other man in your life, whoever that might be. Uh, because let's, let's face it, women, sometimes the men don't measure up very well. They, they do the wrong thing. And we men, we need to repent and get back to God, but we don't always. So, God wants us also, oh, and let's, let's cite James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God is this, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So James says, hey, i got two things. If you want this, if you want to measure yourself up as a good Christian, you should be doing these two things. You should be caring for the poor and those that are hurting and dying, and you should be keeping yourself from sin. Two things. That's if you can sum up the Christian religion, that's what it would be. And what it's saying here is that a godly woman cares for those that are poor and needy and struggling financially. Number 12 says that God says that a godly woman will be prepared for difficulty ahead. Verse 21. She is not afraid of the snow. For her, for her household, all her household are clothed with scarlet. Basically, she looks ahead. I mean, here we are. This is kind of a short-term thing. In the summer, what do we do? We get on our shorts and our t-shirts, and we all run around in our flip-flops, right? Or maybe whatever, whatever you prefer, right? And you're out there enjoying the hot weather. But eventually, the weather changes, right? The fall changes. We've got to get off the jackets and the coats and everything else. Uh, a godly woman looks ahead and goes, wait a minute. Life is not always going to be the same. Life is not always, we're not always going to have uh, excess, or we're not always going to have uh, poor. Uh, we're, we need to look ahead and prepare for what God would have next. And she prepares. She looks ahead and goes, you know what, someday it's going to snow. We've got to make sure we have clothes, uh, warm clothes for everyone. So a godly woman, the principle here is that a godly woman looks forward and prepares for difficulty that might be ahead. Uh, and I think of my wife, is constantly doing that. She'd think of, okay, well, if we had we had to move or do something like that, or something difficult happened in our family, what could we do to prepare for those kind of circumstances? Somebody else was sharing me this past week. They said, you know what, life doesn't always stay the same. We're preparing for such, such circumstances in their life. And I thought that was very wise. Um, some of us might not think of that, that specific instance, but uh, preparing ahead, looking ahead and saying, you know what, things are not always going to be as they are now. Things will change. And what can we do to prepare for those things? A godly woman will do that. God says that a godly woman will have skills that will keep her and her family clothed in quality clothing. Let's look at verse 22. She makes herself coverings of tapestry and, her, and clothing is silk and purple. Now, when this was written, this was before the silk road took place. The Romans actually uh, loved silk. They, they absolutely treasured it. It was almost impossible to get. If you had silk, that meant that you had gone to great lengths or expense to obtain that cloth. It was not possible in most, most circumstances. So this woman has not just gotten quality stuff, she's gotten the very, very best to take care of her family with. She gives her very best. How many of us, you know, when, we, when we're asked to take care of someone or something, do we give our very best? Or do we just give some kind of half-hearted attempt? Eh, you know what, it's just no, God says, no, I want you to give your very best. A godly woman will put her all into it. A godly man will, too, trust me, man. This application for you, you too here, right? I mean, if anyone's half-hearted about things, it's us men, right? Let's just be honest. Uh, a lot of times we just like to do just a slap-happy job, and that's it, we're done. Uh, but no, man, we should do our very best. Put our very best into it. Make sure that the product that we make is quality and will last the test of time. Uh, good uh, quality work will last the test of time. And you know what? There's things that we enjoy today that were made centuries ago. I love, I love uh, collecting different things that sometimes are very old. But those very old things still work and function today. I can go out and use them. Uh, because someone uh, over two generations ago sat down and said, we're going to put quality material here. We're going to put our effort into this. 
And that's, I think, a beautiful concept. That's a godly concept. An ungodly concept is to say, no, I'm just going to make it for my generation. I don't care about the next. I'm not going to make all the problem. So a godly woman will do that. A godly woman, number 14, a godly woman will act in such a way that it will bring honor to those in authority over her. And verse 23 is specifically her husband. Her husband is known in the gates. He sitteth among the elders of the land. Now, this isn't a qualification. Like I said, your husband may not be a good guy. He may not be the perfect man. But, because she has done those right, he ends up being blessed. Wow. That's amazing. And what is Gates? What is Gates? You might read through that in English. You might go, okay, he's sitting around the Gates. That sounds kind of weird. What is he doing? The Gates is a place of judgment at that time. It was a place of ruling. Uh, if you sat in the Gates, or you were well-known in the Gates, you were well-known in the community and respected in the community. And uh, basically, this is saying that he is a ruler in the city. And he's, when he sits with the elders... That means he is also another form of ruling in the land. He's a respected man because of the hard work, not necessarily because of him, because of the hard work and character of his wife. How many men in history do we point back to behind that man was a, was a strong, godly woman? You know, you think of John Adams. Uh, we know we think of John Adams as being the second president of the United States, being a, a very uh, powerful individual in early American history. But he constantly gave credit back to his wife, Abigail Adams. Throughout their relationship, throughout their relationship uh, uh, John Adams traveled just continuously. He was just constantly traveling for uh, reasons of uh, diplomacy in foreign countries and things like that. And throughout all that time, he would constantly write his wife, continually seek her, or her advice on matters of state and affairs of, of countries relating to each other. He would say, dear wife, I, I'm trying to deal with policy in Russia. Could you please give me sound advice on how to deal with this situation? And she would write back long, detailed letters on how, giving him advice on how he would be doing, how to do those things. God can use a godly woman to, and that's what I said, to affect the very affairs of state itself. And don't underestimate the menial tasks, women. Don't underestimate that, oh, God is the only God can use me. I'm just not that good. God can use you. Any one of you can start to become this woman today. If you haven't already practiced these things. Number 15. It says that a godly woman is known for the quality that she produces in her business dealings, excuse me, as well as reliability. Now, verse 24. She may be fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Uh, basically, that's what it's saying is, again, she's making quality product. She's willing to work hard to make quality product, and it sells at a great price. Because people know. They go, that is such a good thing. I want to buy that. I want to keep that because I know that's going to be reliable. Uh, you know, when I try to pick a car or try to pick almost anything in my life, I want something that works. I don't have to go back and fix it uh, or buy it or replace it. I want something that works. So she produces quality stuff that works over and over and over again. And also, she delivers girdles or other things to the merchant. Basically, she's reliable in all her business dealings. How many of you have made a business deal and then you backed out of it? For whatever reason? Well, good, so there's lots of people here. <laughs> that might be a difficult one to admit, right? Some of us have been there, right? But God does not want us to be men. This is this can very much apply to you. Do you make business deals? You go, oh, I can't do it now. <laughs> no, sorry. It's too difficult. Or you carry it through. You see it through no matter what. 